Hello everyone and welcome back to yet another video and we're going to be looking at a relatively short study today. So this study is titled quote, enhanced regrowth with five monthly sessions of minoxidil dutasteride copper peptides tattooing for androgenetic alopecia assessed by an artificial intelligence and blinded evaluators unquote by Guilherme Kacheki et al. And as the article title implies, this is a five-session treatment protocol using a sort of tattoo-assisted dermal delivery of a compounded solution that we will shortly get into. This study retrospectively examined seven male patients between the ages 28 to 55 with a median age of 42 who had failed to respond to at least one year of conventional oral or topical therapy. So this could have included oral finasteride, oral dutasteride, topical finasteride, topical dutasteride, topical minoxidil, oral minoxidil, etc., etc., or any variations of those. The tattooing was done once a month for five consecutive months. So the researchers were using a 27-needle rotary tattoo device operating at 70 hertz and penetrating to a depth of 2 millimeters. And for some people, this may come off as a bit of an atypical device to use for mesotherapy. But if you think about it, essentially this is what a tattoo does anyway when it's actually depositing ink under your skin. It's kind of a mesotherapy sort of application. Now, I would imagine, right, it is probably adapted for this sort of medical setting. So to you in the audience, this doesn't mean you go out there and just find a tattoo device and hook some do task ride to it and then start putting it in your scalp. Don't do that, go to a doctor. But anyway, they use this tattoo mesotherapy device to deliver the drugs directly into the dermis, bypassing the outer skin barrier that normally limits the absorption. And it may reduce the chances of systemic side effects compared to just taking these drugs orally, because there's going to be a focus on it being in that sort of dermal tissue. However, Depending on the drug's characteristics, it can determine how it moves throughout the scalp, right? I mentioned this in a previous video, but something like dutasteride, which has a high log P of 5.09, makes it very lipophilic. So its tendency, especially once it's in the paleosebaceous unit, is to go through the hair follicle and build up in the sebaceous glands, eventually reaching the dermal papilla rather than just completely leaking into the nearby blood vessels and then going ultimately systemic. Now, let's talk about the active solution that they used here, which is pretty interesting. They delivered during each session 0.5% minoxidil sulfate at 1 milliliter, 0.1% dutasteride at 1 milliliter, and 1.2% copper peptides at 1 milliliter. The investigators used an analgesic particularly lidocaine, first onto the scalp so it could mitigate any pain that the patients may experience while the tattoo device delivers the 0.5% minoxidil sulfate, the 0.1% dutasteride, and the 1.2% copper peptides. Now, to evaluate treatment efficacy, randomized and de-identified top scalp photographs, so global photographs, were taken at baseline and one month after the final session. These images were analyzed by four blinded dermatologists using the Severity of Alopecia tool, which is acronymized as SALT, S-A-L-T. A primary endpoint of greater than 10% top scalp area growth, or TSAR, as it is acronymized as, was defined based on the changes in the SALT scores. In addition to human evaluation, this study did something pretty interesting. It employed ChatGPT's for O visual processing capabilities to estimate visibility changes directly from the clinical photographs. Now, for me, I'm wondering if they used a special GPT agent plugin to do this. So if you guys are aware of any or any sort of open source tool, definitely leave it in the comment section below. Anyway, the study presented us with some very nice results. The median top quadrant of the SALT score dropped from 40% at baseline to 7.5% after treatment. Five of the seven participants, being 71.4%, achieved a greater than 10% TSAR with a median regrowth of 26.5%. ChatGPT's visual analysis of the scalp visibility achieved TSAR values of 7.5%, 
of the dermatologist median evaluation. So that indicates a sort of close alignment between AI assisted and human clinical assessments of the scalp. Now, again, this is cool because we have the physicians making their visual assessments versus ChatGPT, and this would reinforce the potential use for AI to serve as a supplementary tool in photographic outcome analysis for dermatological conditions. Another thing to mention is that there were no adverse reactions such as scarring, infection, or post-procedure complications that were reported. So it does hint that this protocol is probably tolerable and has a degree of safety. So this is some pretty interesting stuff, but of course there are a lot of limitations. Firstly, there's only seven subjects in this study, so by no means is this really large enough to make a precise and generalizable application. However, I would say the, the results are still compelling, especially given that all seven participants had already failed conventional treatments, and yet most of them showed a substantial improvement. The median top scalp area regrowth for the TSAR, right, the TSAR value, was over 26%, and five out of the seven exceeded the 10% regrowth threshold, which is significant considering the severity of their androgenetic alopecia. But another aspect is that they didn't have a control group in this study, and also objective hair counts, so there was no phototrichogram assessment. So we do have to have a degree of caution when it comes to interpreting these findings. And with that being the case, we need larger studies with more subjects. Now remember, this was a retrospective design, so that means they actually go back and look at data that was already previously recorded, rather than prospectively or actively recording data for a study. So I'm not sure why they weren't able to go back and find more patients that did this protocol. Maybe this is a unique protocol that they did at this particular clinic. But if they did have a history of patients that already did this protocol, I mean, maybe they could have made this study a bit larger. That would have been preferable. But then again, if they didn't do that, that's probably an issue because retrospective papers sometimes have some bias that can be injected depending on what you pick to choose to include in your retrospective review. But anyway, the photos do speak for themselves even if we don't have the exact hair count increase. I personally think this is a very good formulation and a control with more subjects would show how great this protocol is. I find that the copper peptides might be kind of useless. There are some studies that show that it might be good when it comes to healing the skin itself, but nothing necessarily of it having a sort of hair growth stimulatory effect, right? So it could be good for helping the skin recover, maybe in a less fibrotic sense, but we definitely need more research in that aspect alone. Now, the minoxidil sulfate part of the formulation is cool and all, but minoxidil and minoxidil sulfate don't have a long half-life presence. So, you doing this monthly, I don't think this is what's making those kinds of changes in this study, right? However, I will say this just as a public service announcement if you got this far into the video. Minoxidil sulfate may be coming out soon in a liposomal formulation. So pay attention to this channel. Please pay attention to this channel. I've been working hard on this along with my colleagues. We've been working hard on this for, what, maybe like a year, two years now? So pay attention to that. But anyway, getting back to the video, I think the moving factor here, rather, is pretty much dutasteride, right? Dutasteride has a long half-life. This is possibly something you could get away with with monthly injections because of its long half-life. Now, I want to say this first and foremost, I think the higher the dutasteride concentration you go towards, whether you're using it topically or even maybe in some cases orally, and if you're using it topically, whether you're using microneedling along with topical dutasteride application or liposomal topical dutasteride or straight up just regular topical dutasteride and ethanolic solution. By the way, if you do the latter, you have to make sure it's probably at a higher concentration, maybe between 0.15% up to 0.5%. Or if you're just straight up injecting it into the scalp, if you're going to use any sort of topical or mesotherapy dutasteride, it's probably safer to trend towards a higher concentration than a lower concentration. So what does a higher concentration mean? I think maxing out at maybe 1% 
would be the highest concentration. And then from there, anything closer to 1% would probably be more efficacious. Just my hunch, primarily based on my previous video that I made on this particular topic. And real quick, I'm here in the post editing process. When I say safer, I mean efficaciously safer, right? You don't want to spend too much time trying to figure out what is actually going to work for you. So it probably makes sense in terms of an efficacious sense of saving your hair follicles. It's probably safer to err on the side of a higher concentration of the topical detached right solution. Okay, back to the video. Now I'll link those in the description and maybe the comment section. So go check that out. In my opinion, I think topical and or mesotherapy dutastride can be an option for people who want to stack it with oral finasteride or oral dutastride or even topical finasteride itself. Just to get, again, in the sort of theoretical sense, more scalp DHT suppression. And I think it's conceivable that you probably would get more scalp DHT suppression because now you're enhancing the localized anti-5-alpha reductase activity. But I also think the mesotherapy and topical options of dutasteride can be applicable for people who have side effects with oral finasteride, perhaps oral dutasteride, and the very, very rare, super very, very rare case of side effects on topical finasteride. Because, you know, there are going to be some people who have that sort of issue. But in my opinion, I think a lot of these people have some sort of nocebo effect, especially the people who claim that, oh, I've used topical finasteride at 0.005% and I'm having side effects. That's such a low concentration. It's not even going to give you hair growth. So reassess your sort of mindset when it comes to that. And I also have a video on peptides too, which I'll include in the comment section and in the description, either or. Anyway, that's it for this video, and I want to say thank you to my subscriber, Cope Till I Rope 178, for bringing this study to my attention on my other video that had to do with topical dutasteride and the clinical trial that took place in Spain. So I want to say thank you to that subscriber, but also, bro, you know, that name makes me feel kind of sad, bro. You, you know, such a doomeristic name. Please keep your head up. But anyway, thanks for watching this video, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace out, and yes, Pay attention. Hopefully we can get this sort of product coming out soon. Um, there's a lot of, you know, behind the scenes kind of logistics. I don't want to make promises I can't keep, but, you know, I just want to make this sort of micro announcement in this video. Kind of low key. But yeah, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Peace out.